I missed my cue. Good morning. <laughs> How are y'all doing this morning? It is good to be in the house of the Lord with the people of the Lord on the day of the Lord. We are grateful for the opportunity, the honor, and the privilege to worship God together. It is a busy weekend, but it has already been an incredible weekend. Yesterday, we had our car show, uh, and this car show turned out to be the biggest car show ever by a significant amount, 226 cars, which is, is almost 50 more uh, than the car show has ever had, more cars than has ever had, yes. And as you clap, you are clapping for the Lord uh, who has blessed us and blessed yesterday, and we're grateful for uh, how the Lord blessed us in that. Um, and you're clapping for those who volunteered and served the Lord faithfully yesterday. You're clapping for all of those in our student area, of course, led by Jeremy Montgomery and uh, the wind beneath his wings, that is his wife, Jennifer. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and all of our students, man, uh, y'all stand up. Y'all stand up. We want to clap for y'all while you're standing. We don't do that enough. Yes. Yes. We praise God for y'all. Thank y'all for y'all's faithfulness. Y'all want to stay standing the whole service or? Okay, y'all can sit back down. <laughs> no, we are, we are grateful for, for yesterday and how the Lord used our, our students uh, and all those. We got to share the gospel with a lot of people yesterday. Uh, so remember that whenever we talk about people being here, what we're wanting to do is share the gospel with them. And what we did yesterday is share the gospel with hundreds of people uh, that might never hear the gospel if we had not done that car show. So we praise God for that. Uh, and we also look forward to this afternoon and hope you are looking forward to this afternoon uh, as we partake this afternoon in our fall festival. Uh, and if we see the same crowd as last year, we're going to have thousands on our property today. Uh, if we have, uh, uh, if we gain in our audience today, we'll have, what, 2,500 to 3,000 people here. And our goal is to share the gospel with them while they're here today. How many opportunities will we get to have that many people here at one time? So, uh, if you are a, a person who uh, likes to share the gospel or who should like to share the gospel, that pretty much includes everybody who has had the gospel shared with them and responded to the gospel, then I want to invite you and encourage you to be here this afternoon to share the gospel. That's what we want to do this afternoon. Make no mistake about it. We love fellowshipping together. That's what we're been, we've been doing this morning. We love worshiping together. That's what we've been doing this morning. But we love sharing the gospel with those who might never hear it. That's what we're doing this afternoon. That's what we're doing this afternoon. We are sharing the gospel with people. So come love on people, serve. We, I'm sure we can use more hands, so come and be a part of that this afternoon. But before we get to that this afternoon, we are here right now to worship God. He is worthy of our worship, and we yearn to experience Him in worship. If you are a guest, I want to invite you to find this card there in the handout that you received when you came in or in the pew back in front of you. If you will find this card and please fill it out, uh, that will help us minister to you and connect with you. That's what we would love to do. On the back, you'll see a section marked prayer requests. We like to pray around here. Uh, we enjoy talking to God and seeing him answer our requests and we would love to pray for you to minister to you through the ministry of intercessory prayer so please fill this out let us know how we can pray for you also we've been walking through a series on prayer if you have questions please uh, write your question in this section marked prayer request uh, so that we can answer those questions along the way thank you for being here this morning, I want us to do something a little bit different. We've actually done it before. I'm going to invite you to stand. I'm going to lead us in a time of prayer. But before I voice our prayer to God, I just want us to clear some space here for a moment and spend this time in praise and thanksgiving to God. I want us to spend this time in praise and thanksgiving to God. God has blessed us. God has blessed you. 
So I just want us to praise him. I just want us to thank him. Don't ask for anything in this moment. Don't ask for anything for yourself or for anyone else. Just give God praise and give him thanks. Let's take a moment to do that, and then I'll voice our prayer to God. Lord, we truly are joyful today. God, we, happiness is fleeting. The world offers us happiness, Lord, and it's insufficient, God, but you offer us joy, and we give you praise because you give us joy. We give you praise as the God of creation, the God who created all that we could ever see. Lord, the mountain ranges, Lord, the depths of the seas, God, the animals, the stars, all of your creation, how it proclaims your majesty, how it proclaims who you are as the God of the universe. God, we thank you. We praise you for who you are. Lord, we give you praise that you would step off of your throne and come into your created world, that you would live the life we couldn't live you would die on a cross in our place, God, we praise you as the God of our salvation, as the God who beat death, hell, as the God who has once and for all defeated our sins. And Lord, we give you praise as the one who has forgiven us and set us free, Lord. God, we give you praise as the one who has given us all of these blessings that we see each and every day, Lord. All that we can look around and behold that you have given us. As James 1 reminds us, every good thing is a gift from you. God, we thank you. We give you praise. God, we give you praise today that we can worship you with our brothers and our sisters in Christ. Those that you have also changed, Lord, that we can join together and sing to you with a full heart and an open mouth because you've changed us. God, we give you praise. We give you thanks. God, we thank you for your word, how your word has changed our lives, how your word has changed this world. God, we thank you that today we get an opportunity to hear from you through your word. God, we thank you that today you have called us to be a part of your business, that of reaching the lost. And God, I pray that you would encourage us through our prayers and through the work of evangelism, Lord. I pray that you would help us, God, to be the people you've called us to be, doing the things you've called us to do. And God, we praise you and thank you for the honor and the privilege that we have in that. God, we give you praise for who you are and for all the reasons that you have given us, are giving us, and will continue to give us to worship you. God, we give you praise. You are so good, Lord. We thank you for who you are. Lord, as we continue to sing to you, as we continue to worship you, Lord, I pray, Jesus, that you would inhabit the praises of your people. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to turn your attention to the baptistry as we continue to praise God through a person who has come to faith in Jesus. 
So, folks, this is Lance Ritchie. Lance has been coming to our church for a while, but ever, stand up, Lance. Okay. Ever since he's come to our church, he has worried about the fact that he knows he accepted Christ as his personal Savior since he was a member of the church and not, has not been baptized since he's been saved. And today he wants to make a public profession of that. He wants to thank those guys that came to his doorstep years ago and visited him door to door and invited him to Dolphin Way. And today we want to baptize him in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried as Jesus was buried. <laughs> raised as Jesus was raised. <laughs> Father God, thank you so much for this opportunity of testimony this morning. Dear Father, thank you for Lance and his willingness to come and be a part of Believer's Baptism. Today, sitting in this group, in this worship center, I know of people that we've talked about their public profession of faith. Today, Lance has made his. I pray that it's a testimony to others that this is the day that they need to be saved. This is the day that they need to put their faith in Jesus and become a follower of the way. In your son's precious name we pray. Amen. Oh, amen. Isn't that great, church? Let's stand. Let's let our praises ring out to the Lord. We give you thanks, Lord Jesus. For all that you've done in our lives. Oh, Lord, my God, in you I put my trust. Again, if you like put my trust, oh Lord my God. 
Lord, it is you that we give our praise to. We're so grateful. Pastor said we start with gratitude and thanksgiving. So thankful for all that you've done for us. So it's with a grateful heart, Father, we come before you in worship today. Thank you for all that you've done for us. We praise you. And we bless you, sir. I come before you today. what you did for us at the cross. Thank you for what you did through our Lord Jesus Christ. You have paid it all. All to you, Father. We give our all to you. At the cross, your love ran down and our sins washed away. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Dreams. 
Thank you. Sin had left a crimson stain, but you washed it white as snow. As far as the east is from the west, our sin has been removed. Lord, we are truly grateful. We offer our sincere thanks. We truly are in awe of you and your great love and how you pursue us constantly. There's no one ever good enough. There's no one ever bad enough for your great love. 
you bore it all, that we might have eternal fellowship with you. And we are thankful. Thank you, Father God. We bless you. We worship you. As we move into the time where we offer our tithes and offerings to you, may it be a continuation of our worship, a continuation of giving our all to you, have you, have you, as you have commanded us in Scripture. Lord, we present this to you as, as pleasing, as good seed to good soil. Grateful for how you have blessed us. Lord, you are our shepherd, and we shall not want. We look to you to guide us in all things. Father, we thank you. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Today at our fall festival, which will follow this afternoon, the games start at 3 o'clock. Is that right? 3.30. Uh, okay, I'm going to start early then. So games start at 3.30. At 5 o'clock, we're going to have some music performing. Then at 5.30, Pastor Blake's going to get up, and we have a special guest, and Pastor Blake's going to share for a little bit. You won't want to miss that. And one of the groups that will be performing is a group from the University of Mobile. As many of you know, I, I'm the chair of the worship leadership department there, the technology department, and this is the group that I oversee specifically. I have a couple, but this is the one that is, is my direct group, and this, the name of this group is Ignite. They're new this year. It's a praise and worship, contemporary praise and worship group, and they're going to be singing today, and uh, Friday was their first appearance ever since they really just started in September. Wasn't it September we got started? Right, so they're going to be singing today. Would you please help me welcome Ignite.
come. It will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts. As we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom. The power and the glory forever. Would you join me for prayer? God, we thank you for your presence here among us today. God, I pray that as you're here, and as you're moving, God, I pray that you would speak to us in such a way that we cannot help but listen. God, I pray that we would not miss you today. And all that is, that is going on in this room, in this moment, Lord, I pray that we would not miss you. Lord, help us to hear what you have to say to us. God, we're so grateful for who you are. We're so grateful for what you've done in our lives, Lord. And our prayer is, God, that you would just help us, Lord. Help us to have ears to listen. Lord, help us to not only have ears to listen, Lord, but help us to have the heart that is open to you, God heart that's willing to hear from you, a heart that's willing, Lord, to be changed by you. God, you're the best thing that we have in our lives. There truly is nothing that compares to you. But Lord, it's so easy to forget that in the midst of our days, in the midst of our weeks, in the midst of our lives, Lord, it's so easy to forget who you are and just how good you are. So, Lord, I pray that today you would remind us and call us, Lord. Call us, Lord, to be those people that you've created us to be, that you've transformed us to be, Lord. God, speak. And help us to listen, Lord. Help us to respond. We're needy people, God. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. I got a text this morning from a pastor, a friend of mine. He's been a friend since seminary, and he, uh, he texts me every Every Sunday morning, we exchange texts, he and some other minister friends of mine just encourage and say, we're praying for you. It was odd this morning, he texted me, and uh, I looked at the text, and it was a little bit earlier than he usually texts, but uh, he just said, praying for you uh, in a dark time for our country, that we would be the light of Jesus. What struck me about that text was that in that moment, I had to think about what's dark in our, in our country. What I mean is, what exactly was he referring to? And I was thinking about the, the bombs that were sent in the mail, and I was thinking about the shooting that was in the Jewish synagogue. And what really struck me was like, I, I've, I think we've gotten used to the kind of news that 10 years ago would have really shook us. 
And when he texted me about darkness in our, in our country, I, I've become so familiar with the symptoms of spiritual darkness in our nation that I fear, and I hope this is not happening, that I've become anesthetized to them, that I've become inoculated to them, meaning um, they just don't have the same effect that maybe they did years ago. But we are truly living in a spiritually dark time in our nation. But the problem with it is we're still so very comfortable that we're not understanding the implications of the darkness around us. Because those things that happened this week, wherever they happened, didn't affect me one bit, in a sense. What I mean is, they didn't affect food that's on my table or the place where I live or anything like that, right? I didn't see the effects. not like someone declared war and invaded the country and now we've got to change. What's odd is that someone, by the way, has declared war and has invaded the country. And we're living like they haven't. We're living like the enemy has not invaded the world of God and is at war against us. And it's just a reminder this morning of the spiritual darkness and the need for the church to wake up. And we're so sick as the church in the West because we're so comfortable. And we don't even realize how sick we are. And I see it in the landscape of our churches. There are those churches, man, all they want you to do when you come to their building is they just want you to feel good and be happy. And if they can present themselves as the place on the block or in the city that will make you feel the happiest, then they win and you'll come back. We just want to be happy, don't we? I've been thinking a lot about Isaiah 6 and how Isaiah gets a vision of God. And by the way, it didn't make him happy in that moment. But you better believe he was worshiping. And he had a transformative experience with the God of the universe. And it didn't start with him just feeling all good about himself and feeling happy. We've gotten to a place in our church cultures to where if they can make you feel happy, that's where you want to go. There's no sense of the divinity in that. It's flesh. It's an appeal to our flesh in the name of Jesus. And we're buying it because we want to be happy. Doesn't God want us to be happy? Show me that in Scripture, please. Have that conversation with the Apostle Paul, would you? Hey, pick a disciple. <laughs> and then there's the second aspect of Isaiah's vision where he sees God and then he sees himself and he realizes his sinfulness, does he not? We don't like the idea that we might be sinful. We don't like the idea that there could be something wrong with us. We're all about the self-esteem. We want people to feel good about themselves when the reality is sin is killing us. And so we have a culture in which if you toss in the concept of sin, well, people are walking out. But then there's also the danger that I find in our church culture. In Isaiah 6, Isaiah sees God. He gets a picture of the divinity. And then he sees himself. And then God changes his life. And then Isaiah is moved out of that moment into a response to the people around him. And there are a lot of churches, man, they, they paint an accurate picture of God and an accurate picture of sin, and they just want you to sit there and grow theologically fat on the word that they're preaching. 
Don't go out and minister to the starving theologically around you. Just keep coming here, and we're going to make you theologically and spiritually. We're going to fill your head with all kinds of doctrines, but don't worry about going out and seeing the lost saved. And we see all of this in Isaiah 6, where Isaiah sees God, he sees his sin, and then he's moved outwardly. He doesn't stay in the temple. He's moved to the lost around him. Who, who will I send, or who shall I send, and who will go for us? And he says, here am I, send me. God, I want to go. I want to share. And he wants what's happened in his own life to happen in the lives of those around him. He's not content just, just hanging out, basking in the presence of God. He wants others to be brought into the presence of God. And so we've got another whole element of the church culture. They just want you to come, and they'll feed you, feed you, feed you, but they won't push you out to go share Jesus with others. And all of these are dangerous because they're not rooted in Scripture. Can we truly say we've had an encounter with God if we're not wanting others to have an encounter with God? You don't see that in Scripture where they go, oh man, I was so blessed in my, in my experience of God today that I just, I don't, I don't want to tell anybody. Jesus has so changed my life that I, I think I'm just going to keep it to myself. And the danger that I'm seeing is that we're so comfortable We've lost a sense of heaviness that has been true of the church since its very beginning. A heaviness because we look around and we say, all is not right. And believe me, I would love to just preach sermons to make us feel happy. But I feel like the prophet who's saying, how can I say peace, peace when there is no peace? Peace. How in the midst of a week like this can we just think peace, peace, when there obviously is no peace? And how does it not weigh us down? And if it does, what do we do with it? Do we just walk around moping all the time? I don't want to do that. I don't think God's called us to do that. But God has called us to bear a burden. And he's called us to intercede with that burden. And he's also called us to experience the joy of the Lord and the peace that only Jesus offers. How do we reconcile all this? You can't, but the spirit in you can. This morning, I want us to continue talking about praying for the lost. Praying for the lost. We're focusing on the how of praying for the lost today. I want to remind us of the statement that we unpacked last week. What we believe about the lost determines how we pray for the lost. Meaning if we don't really pray for the lost, then we probably don't really believe they're lost. What we believe about the lost determines how we pray for the lost. And I began this morning saying the same thing as I said last week. I understand that there inevitably are those who are in this building right now who are away from God. We want to follow them under the prodigal, but the prodigal falls in the same sequence of those things that are lost. And so the Bible would say the prodigal is lost. I would encourage you as we think through this, as we think about those prodigals in our lives, to just put them in the same category as the lost. Because that's what Luke 15 does. I'm not saying they're lost. I'm saying for our purposes and for understanding how we should pray for them, I think we should file them under the lost so that we would truly agonize in prayer over them. If you are here today and you are away from the Lord, I don't want you to hear me coming down on you. I do want you to hear the truth. I desperately long for you to hear the truth. I can't even begin to explain to you how I long for you to hear the truth. The truth that there is a God who loves you and has gone out of his way to find you 
And my prayer is that he would find you today and that you would respond to him. And I pray for everyone who has found him today that we would recognize the lost people around us and seek the God who seeks the lost that he would find those sheep around us that he would save them. I want us to talk about how. I want to give you a few quotes here to just get us moving in that direction. First quote is from a man named Hudson Taylor. Hudson Taylor is a man who changed my life because of how he changed George Mueller's life. George Mueller, you've heard me say this before, George Mueller's biography is uh, outside of the Bible was the most influential book in my life. Um, and Hudson Taylor influenced George Mueller, and Hudson Taylor was a man who just trusted God for everything. He would go without food, but he wouldn't ask man for anything. He would ask God. And God gave him unsearchable riches through his prayers. But Hudson Taylor learned as a 19-year-old, he learned this lesson, and he stated it this way. How important to learn to move man through God by prayer alone. How important to learn to move man through God by prayer alone. There are some of you, you've tried. You have tried your absolute best to reach that person. You've said everything you could say to them, and they are not listening to you. I want to invite you, I want to encourage you to talk to God more passionately than you've talked to that person. Talk to God more passionately about that person than you will that person again. Just talk to God and learn that we actually can move man through God in prayer. We actually will move more people through God in prayer than we could ever move in our interactions with people. Louis Ferry Schaefer, whom God has used profoundly, and I'm so grateful to Dr. Dale Yance for giving me this book to read. Louis Ferry Schaefer said, The present failure on the part of Christians to enter the holy place in intercession according to the appointment of God is sufficient to account for the present lack of Holy Spirit conviction and conversion in the church. Louis Berry Schaefer is writing this in the early 1900s. Understand what he's saying, and we're going to circle back to this. He's saying the reason that we're not seeing conversions in our churches is because we're not praying in intercession. There's a direct connection is what Louis Berry Schaefer is saying. A great theologian of the 1900s is saying this. He also says this, prayer presents the greatest opportunity for soul winning. There are some of you in here, you say, man, I, you talk about soul winning. I can't come out there this afternoon, just meet a stranger and, and share the gospel with them. You understand what Schaefer's saying? He's saying that you can actually win souls, not just by talking to them directly. I'll be glad to do that for you in a sense, but you got a promise to pray for me. You're not off the hook in this. You're not off the hook, by the way, of sharing with your mouth. I just, I'm saying that if you want the greatest opportunity to win souls, pray for lost souls. Schaefer goes on to say, true soul winning work is more a service of pleading for souls than a service of pleading with souls. Wow. It's more of a pleading for souls than a pleading with souls, meaning talking to God about man rather than talking to man about God. Church, this does not let us off the hook with talking to man about God. What it does is it gets us on the hook for talking, about, talking to God about man. And I guarantee you this, I guarantee you this, the more you pray about lost people, the more you will share with lost people. I don't doubt that you will pray so much you will not open your mouth in the presence of lost people. 
I doubt that the reason we're not opening our mouths in the presence of lost people is because we're not praying for lost people. I want to give you two statements and then talk about characteristics of the one who is interceding for the lost. First statement is this, our position in Jesus makes us expectant in prayer. Our position in Jesus makes us expectant in prayer. What do I mean here? Prayer demands an expectation on our part that God is the ultimate source of the answer. This is what distinguishes us as Christians and the other religions of the world. They pray out of obligation. We pray out of devotion to God. And we're devoted to God and we expect not that we deserve it, but we expect because he's called us to it that he hears us when we pray and he responds. Why do we expect that? Because he says that he will. Because we're in a relationship with the God of the universe through the person and work of Jesus Christ. He hears us when we pray. And we expect that not only does he hear us, but he moves in response. Do you have an expectation in prayer that God will answer your prayer every time even for the lost our expectation that God's going to answer prayer comes from our position in Jesus Christ there is no pressure on me when I understand that God's not inviting me into his presence because I'm such a good guy God's inviting me into his presence because Jesus is the perfect Savior. All the pressure's off of this guy. And I can just come into his presence, praising him for the ability to come into his presence because of the work of Jesus. And I can lay my petitions before him and expect that he's listening to me because of the work of Jesus, not because of my works. To cast ourselves on God, though, believing in him for prayer, it causes us to be vulnerable. There's a little part of me, and I'm going to venture a guess to say there's a little part of you that really wants to handle these things myself. Anybody else in that boat with me? And so an expectation in prayer means, okay, God, I can't fix this. I can't change this. I am hopeless apart from you. That is the epitome of vulnerability. And that is one thing that's desperately missing in our prayer lives. To feel this sense of hopelessness in his presence and say, God, I need you to move. I need you to work because if you don't, we're finished, God. To cast ourselves on God Believing in him for prayer is the ultimate source of humility. Which means oftentimes we pray little because our pride gets in the way. I got this, God. I'll help you out. No, humility says, I don't got this, God. And I can't help you out. Believing in him is the ultimate source. Brings us to a place of surrender. Surrender. Dependence, trust. And so we often reject prayer because we don't want to surrender. We don't want to be dependent. We don't want to trust. We trust in ourselves, depend on ourselves. It moves us further and further away from expecting God to answer. Our position in Jesus makes us expectant in prayer. Secondly, our position before God makes us responsible to others. We talked about this last week. It's important to mention again and then allow it to propel us into the characteristics of intercessors. 1 Peter 2, 9 tells us that we are a royal priesthood. We're chosen people, royal priesthood, a holy nation. And priest's job was to make intercession for the people. Now, we don't intercede for people in order that they might be saved, meaning I can't save anybody, but I know the one who can. And I'm asking the one who can to save them. 
And so in essence, what God has called all of us as believers in Jesus Christ to be about is the ministry of intercession because that's our position as priests before God. And so we continue to bring people before God, making intercession for them, knowing that only God can forgive them, only God can save them, but I'm surely going to bring them. The idea, when we think about Luke 15, and we think about that shepherd who's looking for the lost sheep, what we're doing is we're saying, hey, hey, I know where they are. Because he's come to seek and to save the lost. We're saying, hey, he's right there. Hey, she's right there. We're saying, God, I know that you want to save. I don't have to ask you to desire to save. You already, this is your idea of salvation. It's your idea, God. I just know where some lost sheep are. Can you come find them over here? That's what we do as priests. We make intercession. I don't know why God has chosen to do it this way, but he has. And he's put us in an incredible position of honor. Makes me think of Luke chapter 5 when Jesus is beginning his ministry, or so Luke presents it. And we see these friends bringing their friend, who happens to be a paralytic, they're bringing him to Jesus, right? The crowd's so large that they couldn't get in, and they cut a hole in the ceiling to lower this man down so that they could bring him into the presence of Jesus. And we automatically want to go, Jesus healed him. But do you remember what Jesus said to him before he healed him? Your sins are forgiven. And it offended everybody in the room. These friends brought their friend to Jesus and his sins were forgiven by Jesus. That's exactly the picture that we should have in intercession. We do not have the power to save, to heal, but we do have the ministry of intercession because of our position as priests before God to bring them into his presence constantly and saying, Jesus, save, Jesus, heal. Our position in Jesus makes us expectant in prayer, and our position in Jesus makes us responsible to others. Now, let's move into the characteristics of intercessors. There are several characteristics, and we're going to move through most of them very quickly, very quickly. But there's one we're going to camp out in just a little bit. The first one, the characteristics of those who intercede for the lost, meaning those who are praying that the lost would be saved. The first characteristic is compassion in prayer. Compassion in prayer. Lee E. Thomas, who wrote a good little book on how to pray for the lost, made this statement, prayer has been described as love on its knees. Oh, that's a good picture. Compassion for those who are away from God. You might be saying right now, well, I don't have compassion for those who are away from God. There's good news. There's one who does have compassion for those who are away from God. And the more time you spend with him, the greater your compassion will grow. So the more you pray for the lost, guess what? The more you will pray for the lost. Because the more you pray for the lost, the more your compassion just burns and bursts within you to where you want to constantly bring the lost before God in prayer. To where you're checking out and you're saying, oh, God, save this person. I don't know if they know you, but God, save them. To where the person that cuts you off, and I'm speaking to myself here, cuts you off in, the, in traffic, that instead of saying, God, get them, I would say, God, save them. I really want him to get him. And in that moment, I'm praying those imprecatory psalms, meaning those psalms of punishment and judgment that you see in psalms. But I need to be praying those prayers of salvation for them, right? Oh, God, the way that they've intervened and interrupted my life, I pray that you would intervene and interrupt their life. We'll see if I can work that into my mind as they interrupt my life in traffic. The point is, the more, we, the more time we spend with the Lord, the more compassionate we become for those who are away from God. And then the more compassionate we become towards those who are away from God, the more we pray for those who are away from God. Conversely, if we have very little compassion for those who are away from God, it probably indicates that we're not hanging out with God as much as we should be. 
Compassion in prayer. Secondly, this is the one we're going to camp out in for a few minutes. Compassion in prayer, which moves us into sympathetic suffering in prayer. Sympathetic suffering in prayer. In the death of Jesus, we see the warning of doom and the wooing of love, says Chafer. Oh, I love that picture. We see the warning of doom and the wooing of love. The cross shows just how intense the need of man for God is. Because we see what sin does when it's concentrated on one person. And we see the fury of God on sin. We see it connected, combined in the cross. We see the warning of doom, the warning of what sin does to our lives. And we also see right there in that moment the love of Jesus for us. And after believing in Jesus, we become sympathetic to those who are away from Jesus. We can't help but become sympathetic. We can't help but be compassionate. And we intercede for them. We begin suffering spiritually, carrying their burdens to the Father in prayer. I want to invite you to turn to Romans. We're going to bounce through several passages of Scripture, and we're going to reference a number of Scriptures today. If you come here regularly, you know that my preference is to take a passage of Scripture and just preach through it. As we're talking about prayer, we really want to learn from God and God's Word, what He has to say about prayer. Romans chapter 9, I think I might have said Romans 1. Romans chapter 9 is where I want us to go. We're going to read a few verses in Romans chapter 9, and I want you to see this idea of sympathetic suffering. As we bring these passages together, my hope and my prayer is that we would see the work that God is calling us to do. Sympathetic suffering and prayer. In Romans chapter 9, verse 1, Paul is writing to the church in Rome, and he says, I speak the truth in Christ, which we should pause and say, huh, why is he saying that? Could it be because he's about to say something that we'll go, oh, Paul, no, man, you're just playing. Ah, you're just messing with us, Paul. You're just using hyperbole, Paul. He says, no, no, I speak the truth with what I'm about to say. I am not lying, and my conscience testifies to me through the Holy Spirit. Meaning, if God himself were standing before you right now, he would testify to what I'm saying. What's he about to say? Verse 2, that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. Just be happy, Paul. For crying out loud, man, don't you know what the church is for? Just be peppy, brother. Just feel good, brother. No, I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart is what he says. Why? He takes it further. For I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the benefit of my brothers and sisters, my own flesh and blood. What's he saying? This is the epitome of sympathetic suffering. Paul has taken up the position of Jesus Christ. What did Christ do? Christ said, I love you so much that I'm willing to be separated from God for a moment so that I can take Take your sin, intercede on your behalf so that you might know God. And Paul says, I feel you, Jesus. I get it, brother. I would wish that I could be cut off from Jesus so that others could be connected to him. That's a man who spent time in the presence of Jesus because he's just like Jesus in this moment, is he not? Now, we're talking about a man who looked back in the book of Acts. He was killing people for God. And now he's saying, I would die for them. That's what happens when we spend time with Jesus, church. He completely changes us. He's not trying to kill those who are away from God now. He's trying his absolute best for God to save them through him. And he's saying, God, I just want them to be saved. And if it takes me spending an eternity apart from you, I'm willing to do that. Church, I have never felt that way about a human. I'll just be honest with you. You know what that tells me? I need to spend some more time with Jesus. And my prayer is that before I die, I would be able to say exactly what Paul says in Romans chapter 9. God, you know this to be true, that I wish you would cut me off for the sake of others. But just save them, God. Sympathetic suffering for Christ. 
Chafer said, suffering with Christ then in its deepest meaning is to come to experience by the Spirit an unutterable agony for men out of Christ. And from that vision and love to be willing to offer personal sacrifice or endure physical pain if need be that they may be saved. What are you talking about? Psalm 126 verses 5 and 6 says, Those who sow in tears will reap with shouts of joys. Though one goes along weeping, carrying the bag of seed, he will surely come back with shouts of joy, carrying his sheaves. Leonard Ravenhill said it this way, God does not answer many prayers. They are too locked up in self-pity or aimed at personal benefit, but he does answer desperate prayer. When some Salvation Army workers came to General Booth asking for advice because they were working and they weren't seeing many people saved and they were praying and they weren't seeing many saved, General Booth sent them a letter in reply with two words, try tears. They did and a great harvest broke loose. I I, I don't think we understand this. Revival in Brazil broke out and it was said that you could go into the churches in Brazil and the paint was peeling off the walls because of the people's tears. We can't even get people to come to prayer meeting in our churches in the West. They're praying the paint off the walls where God is moving. In South Korea, they got together at 5 o'clock every morning praying that God would move. And guess what? He did and there's a custom in Korea, they, they have this question that they ask one another about how many trees have you uprooted? And apparently in South Korea, when, when God's really on you and you're burdened for someone or you're burdened for something, you go off and you spend all night in prayer and you grab a tree and you're gripping the tree as you pray and eventually as you're praying all night, you uproot the tree. And so when they want to ask you how, how devoted you are as a Christian, they don't say how often do you go to church, how much do you tithe, they ask you how many trees you've uprooted. How can we say peace, peace when there is no peace? Many of you know Donnie Sumner. That name might sound familiar. The nephew of J.D. Sumner. Donnie Sumner left his Christian upbringing and went to sing backup for Elvis Presley. Got into drugs. Was saved on the roof of a Las Vegas casino outside of Elvis's suite. When he tells his testimony, he tells the story of his dad. His dad was a preacher. His dad prayed for him two hours a day for nine years and fasted. He ate one meal a day for nine years. He ate one meal a day and he fasted. He fasted and ate one meal a day and he prayed two hours a day that his son would be saved. Donnie Sumner will not tell his testimony without telling about what his dad did. That's what we're talking about. A man who says, I don't care about my body. I don't care about my comfort. I can't be happy. My son is lost. How could I go about as though everything is, how can I think that everything is peace, peace, when there is no peace? We're surrounded by lostness. How could we dare just want to be happy? And we're calling to one another, peace, peace. And God's saying, where? Have you looked around? Where is the peace? It's not in this world right now, church. And it's not going to be here until Jesus returns. But what we can offer to people is peace in their heart, peace in their life, even when it's not in the world. Now, this is where we say, Blake, I'm struggling here because I feel like all you want me to do is walk around moping. No, this is what I'm saying about intercessory prayer. It's when God loads us down with a burden so heavy and we can't help but tote it into his presence and say, God, I can't carry this. You need to take it from me. And this burden that's weighing me down is the lostness of my grandmother, the lostness of my aunt, and the lostness of my uncle, and the lostness of so many family members in my family right now. 
Hey, God, I can't. I can't deal with this. I need you to save them, Jesus. God, save them. And there is no peace until you bring peace in their life. I cannot unload this burden except in your presence. And if you take it away, and the only way you take it away is when they get saved. So God, save them. Don't let me rest until they're saved, Jesus. Because I rested too much before my grandfather died. Sympathetic suffering in prayer. I'm going to cruise through these last ones so that we can just pray. I need to, to mention these two elements because I fear that many of us are locked up in here in these two elements. One is purity in prayer and the other is unity in prayer. I want to connect these for the sake of time. In Psalm 66, 18, it says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. In 1 Timothy 2, 8, God says, I want men in every place to pray, lifting up holy hands without arguing and without anger. I want you to put those two together. I want men to lift up holy hands in prayer without anger and without argument. And I want us to connect that with unity. Because here's the reality. For some of you, you're harboring resentment against a, a believer in Jesus. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, if you go to the altar, meaning if you go to worship and you see that your brother has an offense against you, you need to leave that altar and you need to go get it right. Now, typically we think, oh, well, he's talking about in Jerusalem, right? Like just walk down the street. No, 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 no. He's talking about wherever you have been and you go to Jerusalem and you leave that gift at the altar and you realize that your brother has something against you, you better hike it however many miles it is. You need to get right with your brother and then hike it on back because your gift is still at the altar. Some of you are praying that God would bring your lost family member to Jesus and you're not be making it right with fellow believers in the church. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Unity in prayer. Purity in prayer. You want to open the channels of God's work in your life? Forgive somebody you're holding a grudge against. Why does the devil disrupt the unity of the church? Because it hinders our prayers. It hinders the work of the Lord. That's why he does it. It's fun to him. It's sport to him. But he also knows if you're harboring resentment against this person, the prayers you have for this person are stunted and minimized. Some of you, the, the most spiritually impactful thing that could happen in your life today is for you to forgive a brother or sister in Christ or for you to go to a person and ask them for your forgiveness. Purity and unity in prayer. Also perseverance in prayer. In Luke 11, there's a man who goes to his neighbor and he knocks on the door and he says, hey, I, I need some food because I've got a friend who's come and I don't have any bread. And the man says, go away, I'm in bed. What does he do? He keeps knocking. What's he knocking for? He's knocking for food, for bread, for his friend. And Jesus uses that as a parable to teach us about prayer. What this means is, brothers and sisters, keep knocking. Keep knocking. Keep knocking from the, for the bread of heaven to come to your lost family members and friends. Keep knocking for the bread of heaven to come to the people in this city, in this community, for the people who will walk on our campus today. Keep knocking that Jesus would provide spiritual bread to all of these people in desperate need for it. Keep knocking. Persevere in prayer. And commit in prayer. Commit in prayer. Even when we don't feel like it, we must pray. And what happens is an amazing thing. All of a sudden we find ourselves in prayer and we really feel like it. That's what God does in our hearts in prayer. I can't talk about this without talking about John Hyde who prayed so desperately. His nickname was Praying Hyde. And I shared part of his story last week. 
honestly, I need to share it every week for my sake and for your sake. John Hyde was a missionary in India and he prayed that God would give him a soul every day. Some person would respond to the message of Jesus every day. That year, God gave him 400 souls. So the second year, he said, huh, let's try my luck here, right? So he prayed for two souls a day. That year, God gave him 800 souls. So the third year, he said, okay, God, give me four souls a day. If you read about praying Hyde, you will find him towards the end of the day in agony in prayer, if only two or three were saved. And he's agonizing, saying, God, I want four, and I will not go to bed until you give me four. Just for a pause here, in one book about evangelism, it said that the average Christian does not share the gospel to the point where only four out of a hundred share the gospel before they die. You realize that John Hyde saw more people saved in a day than most Christians will ever share with in their life? That should break our hearts. But he said, God, give me four a day. And his health began to fail. And his friend said, John, you're not doing well. You need to go see a doctor. The doctor checked out his health and said, I don't know what you're doing, but the stress and the strain on your body is killing you. And if you keep doing it, you're going to die. I'm talking about suffering for the sake of Jesus and for the sake of the lost. It's at that point where we'd get in our flesh and say, well, John, cut that out, right? The doctor said that his heart had actually moved in his chest because of all the stress and the strain. And he said, if you don't, if you don't stop, you're going to die. That's what we're talking about in seeing people come to know Jesus. Is it to that level? No, 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 no. I'm not, I'm not saying that God's calling all of us to be a man whose nickname is praying. <laughs> that that kind of that sets him apart. What I am saying to us is might we be willing to fast? Might we be willing to say, God, I'm not going to bed tonight? Might we be willing to get up early and to stay up late? Might we be willing to exchange some levels of comfort in our life so that we might suffer sympathetically, interceding for the lost around us? Would we be willing to do that? That is what we're missing in the West in our churches. You know the most joyful people that I've ever encountered are those who agonize and suffer the most in their prayer lives. Without a doubt, they go to God and it's as though they change in the presence of God and they're in agony bringing people to him. And I've seen them weeping against the walls, praying that God would move, praying that God would do a work unlike anything we can even imagine. And if you've heard me tell this story, you've heard me say that I looked around and said, if this is praying, what in the world have I been doing? So let's respond. I want to give you something practical that I want to encourage you to do. Number one is make a list of lost people that you know and start praying for them. Number two, I want you to enlist a prayer partner. Somebody that will pray with you and hold you accountable to prayer for the lost. And I want to encourage and invite you to make praying for the lost more of a priority than any other prayer request you have on your list. Praying for the lost. Make a list of lost people. Start praying for them. Get a prayer partner. Husband and wife would be an awesome prayer partnership. Get your family together and pray for the lost as a family. You want to create an urgency and a burden in your kids for the lost? Start praying for the lost with them. Somebody that will hold you accountable to praying for the lost and make it the priority of your prayer list that God would save souls. 
Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? It's time for us to respond. Last week, God moved powerfully. We never want to duplicate a work. What we want to do is be sensitive to the Spirit. The altar is open. We're down front and would love to pray with you. I would love, our pastors would love to pray with you for the lost. If you have a lost son or daughter, grandson or daughter, anyone in your family who doesn't know Jesus, respond. Would you come and lay them down at the altar? Release a burden to the Lord and say, God, I want to release this to you right now and trust that you will save them but help me to pick it up daily so that I can lay it down at your feet again. There might be some here today that don't know Jesus. I want to invite you right now in this moment to ask God to save you, to forgive you, to change your life. God will do that right now. If you ask God to do that, I want to invite you to come and let me know and let's have a conversation. Because I want to help you know what's next. What this means for you and how it changes your life. You don't need me to pray for you. All you need is just to have a conversation with God in which you ask God to forgive you of your sins and give you new life. I invite you to do that now if you don't have a relationship with Jesus. Everyone who does, God is clearly calling us as a church to be a church focused on, sold out to prayer. And I'm asking you to respond. Some have already responded. I invite you to respond in this moment. I'm going to pray for us. And I invite you to cast your cares upon the Lord. If you're concerned about the lost, will you cast them on the Lord today? Will you bring these souls before God who loves them and cares for them and wants to save them? Will you respond and ask God to help you to do some sympathetic suffering so that people might know Jesus? I invite you during this time to pray for the lost. I invite you to pray for the lost who will be on this campus today. And I invite you, if you are physically willing and able, to join me down front on our knees before the God of the universe, crying out to him for the lost. Lord Jesus, help us to respond to you. God, this is not for show. This is because our heart is breaking for the lost around us. God, we want you to break through into people's lives. And we want you to save souls. God, we can't do it. We need you to do it. God, we need you to move. God, we need you to save. We're hopeless without you, Lord. And we're tired of just going about our day, Lord, seemingly indifferent to the lost around us. God, we pray that you would help us to feel the weight of the lostness among our family members. Lord, help us to feel the weight of the lostness among our friends. Help us to feel the weight of the lostness among our co-workers, Lord. And help us to trudge, trembling into your presence and lay them down in your presence, asking you to save them, Lord. Exchange, God, that sorrow for joy as we see them saved and as we cry out to you, the God of our salvation and the God of their salvation. And God, break us before you and break our hearts for the lost around us. God, this time is yours. We respond to you, Jesus. Lead us now. In these few moments, would you respond? bringing those lost people into the presence of God, making intercession on their behalf. The altar is open. Pastors will be down here, and we'd love to pray with you for those lost people.
let's respond to the Lord.